Welcome to Genomine Grand Rounds. Grand Rounds is a feature of Genomine 360, which is our educational service about all things relating to the intersection of genetics and psychiatry. And the objective of Genomine 360 is to inform and educate our provider customers, our patients, and other interested uh, individuals on this uh, intersection. Uh, we hold grand rounds like this monthly, and we have in the past partnered, for example, with NEI, the Neuroscience Education Institute, to sponsor a free continuing med medical education course on psychiatric pharmacogenetics. You don't have to be an NEI member to access that. You can find that on our website or on NEI website. Uh, today's format's going to be a little bit different than our usual grand rounds, and I had an idea a while ago that people would be interested in watching other smart people discuss a case and kind of dissect the thinking that goes into managing a difficult case or at least a problematic case. So this is a new idea for Grand Rounds. We've never done this before. I'm a little nervous, but I'm also excited about how it's going to turn out. We have invited today a discussant and three presenters. The discussant, our discussant is Andrew Cutler, who's the Chief Medical Officer of the Neuroscience Education Institute in Carlsbad, California. He's also a clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry at SUNY Upstate in Syracuse, New York. Dr. Cutler attended Haverford College in Philadelphia, my hometown, and he also attended the University of Virginia School of Medicine. <coughs> Or is board certified in psychiatry and internal medicine, so you know that he's really smart. Um, he has been the principal investigator or co-investigator on hundreds of studies of psychotropic medications. Our first discussant will be, or our first presenter will be Dr. Chris Bojra, who's the president of Indiana Health Group, which is the largest multidisciplinary behavioral private practice in Indiana. He's um, a distinguished fellow of the American Psychiatric Association. And he received his uh, MD degree from the University of Indiana where he also completed his residency and served as chief resident. He's the past president of the Indiana Psychiatric Society and has served on the board of directors of Mental Health America for Indiana. Dr. Lex Denisenko is an assistant professor of psychiatry at Jefferson University, also in my hometown of Philadelphia. Uh, where he directs the Headache Center. He's a graduate of University of Pennsylvania uh, and completed his internship and residency in psychiatry at Albert Einstein College of Medicine and his fellowship at Thomas Jefferson. And last but not least, Dr. Steve Salzbrenner is assistant professor of psychiatry at the University of Nebraska Medical School. Uh, Dr. Salzbrenner graduated from Creighton Medical School. He then served in the Navy and served, as a, uh, served his psychiatric internship at the Naval Medical Center in San Diego, as well as uh, his psychiatric residency. After leaving the Navy in 2009, he worked in the inpatient and outpatient settings. Presently, he's um, working in, today he's working in the psychiatric emergency room at the University of Nebraska. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Kotler. We're going to watch with interest. Um, for those of you on the call, you can ask questions in the Q&A. You can't ask live questions. Um, what I thought we would do would be to watch these experts discuss a, a patient or three patients. And in a, in a voyeuristic way, we'll see how their minds work. Uh, we'll ask, we can ask questions on the side. There's no right or wrong answer. I uh, appreciate... <laughs> You have to have a strong ego to uh, be able to do something like this, to present to an expert and have your own treatment and diagnoses scrutinized. So uh, gentlemen, take it away, Dr. Cutler. Hey, thank you so much, David. And you know, this is really fascinating because the topic of genetic testing 
is remains controversial, but I think we can all agree that it has its place and it has a role. And I think it's only going to evolve and grow. So I'm really excited about today. I want to thank David and Gina Mind for putting this together and sponsoring it. And I'm, I'm really especially excited to be here with such a great group of colleagues and, and panelists and excellent clinicians. So with that, I, I really look forward to this and we'll see if I can add any anything that makes any sense here at all. But Chris, why don't we get started with you, with your case? Absolutely. Thanks, Andy. Um, so this is, a, uh, this is a case of mine from a number of years ago. This was actually a patient that was referred to me by another psychiatrist in town. This was a family member of his. Um, at the time, it was a 15-year-old male who had been uh, referred uh, after previous attempts at uh, treatment. This is a really interesting young man, academically very gifted, uh, incredibly articulate. Uh, he plays, he's a great musician, plays piano and violin. He's interested in a career in, uh, in or he's interested in political science and social mm -hmm. studies. Just, just a, sort of seems like one of these old soul kind of kids and very, very mature for his age. Uh, and like I said, exceptionally bright. He, you know, he started experiencing some symptoms around age 12, starting with some uh, depressive symptoms, uh, lots of hopelessness, negativity, and at times when it became uh, bad, he would have these episodes of what sounded almost like some some mild derealization. Mm -hmm. um, he had some anxiety symptoms that emerged uh, sort of after the, the depression. Uh, and also started having some obsessive symptoms, never probably reaching the point of meeting criteria for OCD, but there was definitely this obsessive ruminative flavor to a lot of his anxiety. Um, over time, he had become increasingly perfectionistic, um, more socially withdrawn, at least compared to where his baseline was. He's very socially active, involved in a lot of um, uh, extra extracurricular activities, involved in a lot of uh, other group activities with other people. His friends were, were really important to him. Uh, and so while he was, you know, perhaps not horribly socially isolated to, for most people's uh, level, uh, it was definitely a change for him. Some of his compulsive behaviors uh, centered around cleanliness, showering, you know, two to three times a day. Um, he was participating in some sports. He was running cross country and track, and it became increasingly difficult for him because he kept having this feeling like if he wasn't the best, if he wasn't number one, he felt like a failure. Um, he was feeling increasingly paranoid about the, pu about the future, sort of tied in with this, both feeling that um, if, if he wasn't the best, you know, what, what was the point? Um, and also was feeling increasingly controlled by uh, society, feeling sort of lied to by society. He was dealing with uh, issues of, of gender um, uh, or other, uh, you know, sexual orientation at the time. Um, and I think that had been uh, difficult uh, for him, although he had a very supportive family. Um, these infrequent episodes of derealization uh, when he was stressed um, at, at times led to him feeling like time and space were a little distorted. Uh, but never ever, ever having any gross psychotic symptoms. He had some rare instances of self-harm. There were a couple of times when he was, um, you know, especially stressed where he made some light surface scratches on his wrist with a, uh, with a pair of scissors, clearly identifying that this was not a, any type of suicide attempt and really I identified no suicidal ideation, but just sort of feeling hopeless about, you know, the future in general. No relevant symptoms of, of mania or other psychosis on, uh, on testing or on, on prompting. Um, described difficulties with concentration and focus that had become uh, increasingly problematic, uh, although his GPA main, you know, maintained a great GPA. A lot of problems with fatigue. He had a sleep study at one point that was normal. Um, socially lived with, uh, lives with parents and two younger brothers, one younger sister. There's a family history uh, that's pertinent in that mom has had a history of anxiety. He had a maternal grandfather who had a history of pretty severe alcohol abuse and a paternal grandfather who committed suicide. Um, he had started working with a therapist, was initially placed on 20, I'm sorry, 10 milligrams of Prozac that was later increased to 20 milligrams. Didn't see any improvement with it. He had some side effects, but really felt no benefit. They changed him to Lexapro um, at a low dose and then a higher dose. That didn't do anything for him. He later saw a physician assistant and was tried on a number of other medications. Um, 
that he described as all being really having virtually no effect other than some of them having some side effects. So some of the other psychotropics that he was on, both antidepressants and some things, because I think they were sniffing around at ADHD, um, he had been also tried on Adderall, Celexa, Cymbalta, Fetzema, Focalin, Clonopin, Latuda, Lexapro, Lithium, Paxil, and Remeron, in addition to the trials on, uh, on Prozac and Lexapro. So I saw him for the first appointment, and he was very nice. He was very kind, very respectful. But he said, you know, Doc, he said, honestly, because I'm here because of, you know, because of my family member that referred me and for my parents. He said, but I, I just feel like I'm beating my head against a wall. He said, I just don't know if medicines are for me. He goes, I've read about this. I know that they don't work for everybody. He goes, I feel like I've had some really good trials of medicine. He said, but I got to tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm just not... Uh, you know, he goes, I don't want to be a bad patient. I don't want to be, you know, obstinate. He said, but I, I just don't know if I have it in me to try anymore. Um, so we had a conversation and I said, listen, I, I think that's completely understandable. I think anybody in your situation um, would be, you know, would be having the same kind of thoughts or the same kind of feelings. Um, so I, I made him a deal. I said, listen, I said that we have a testing technology now that helps us better understand some, not all, but some of the reasons that patients either may or may not respond to certain medicines or may have specific dosing requirements that might work better for them, or if there are just certain medicines for whom they're either a better or a less good candidate. I said, tell you what, I, I won't prescribe anything now. Let's do the testing. And if the testing comes back, and, it's, and it tells us something based on your experience that would potentially point us in a more rational direction, would you be willing to consider a medicine then? Um, and he said, yeah, that he, uh, he, would, he would be more than happy to do the testing. Um, so I don't know if you, wanna, if you want me to break there and share any thoughts that you have so far. Wow, Chris, what a rich case that is. That is just fantastic. So many different ways to go here. I think you know, there's a diagnostic conundrum, there's a treatment conundrum, there's how much of this is, is symptoms, how much of this is a diagnosis. So just some quick thoughts here. Um, it sounds like people have sniffed around the bipolar diagnosis, but there really are some strong clues to bipolarity here. We've got the early onset before the age of 25 triples the odds that you're bipolar. He's got significant anxiety and obsessiveness. Anxiety is the number one comorbidity with bipolar. He's got that vague dissociation, kind of paranoidy stuff too, which you know is unusual in just pure depression in a young person. Um, also, the the issue of concentration, fatigue, anhedonia; those are things you see a lot with, with bipolar stuff. And then, of course, the failure to multiple medications. Although my ears perked up when you said Latuda and lithium, and so I'm really wondering. You know, I'd want to know more details about exactly how that was done, the doses, the duration, things like that. Also, I forgot the genetic, you know, we're here talking about genetic testing, but the genetics of family history, the more I go on in my practice and my career, the more I really worship at the altar of genetics and, and the power of family histories. So you dropped a couple of interesting clues here with the mother with anxiety, I believe. Um, one of the grandfathers was, it, was an alcohol abuser and, and the other one was uh, committed suicide. That's just screams bipolarity to me or, or you know, some, a serious mood disorder. Of course, you know, in someone like this, he's only 15. You also have to worry about, is this form frust for a psychotic disorder? You know, is he gonna go on to declare something more serious? Um, other things that come to mind, you certainly wanna know any abuse history. PTSD is always a cause for kind of not responding well to certain medications. There's the, the self-harm you know, which you sometimes see in, in people who've been abused and things like that, the superficial cutting, which I agree with you. It's not suicidal. That's a way of discharging anxiety a lot of times for these folks. Um, personality disorder, obviously, we have to think about too. So a really rich case with all kinds of different avenues. Um, I think it's this is the kind of case it's very wise to consider genetic testing to, to figure out, you know, and especially if you can get details of all the different medications he's tried to figure out, has, did he really get an adequate dose and duration? You know, was it really the right idea here? But those are just some of my off the top of my head thoughts. And I, I wonder how that strikes you. 
Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I was, I was sort of interested in the uh, possible diagnosis of, of bipolar, just given the multiple failures and mm -hmm. the, the family history. Um, you know, doing a little more exploration with him and trying to nail down how adequate of trials did he have for some of the mood stabilizers like the, like the Latuda and the lithium that he had been on. Um, it looks like he had pretty good trials, both mm -hmm. by dose and by duration, mm -hmm. and really didn't find any, any benefit. Didn't really have anything that sounded like uh, a manic or even, I couldn't, I couldn't even really talk myself into hypomanic symptoms. Yeah, yeah. Um, you may not see that. Usually the depression yeah. presents first. Um, uh, so we talked about a couple of, of, of you know, these, of these diagnostic possibilities uh, with him. We, we got the uh, results back of the genetic testing um, and the, pharmacogenetic, the pharmacogenetics that are pertinent here, uh, the things that were abnormal, is that he turned out to be a 2D6 ultra rapid metabolizer. Oh, there you go. Yeah. A 2C19 ultra rapid metabolizer. Wow. Yeah. He, he was homozygous for the short form of the SLC6A4 gene. There you go. No, SSRIs won't touch him. Yeah. Um, and uh, had, you know, intermediate uh, activity at, uh, at Compt. Uh -huh. um, and uh, oh, his 5-HT2C, uh, his um, he was homozygous for the C allele there. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, potentially for increased vulnerability mm -hmm. to weight gain on uh, exactly. semi-typicals. Yeah. So, you know, I talked with him about this and I said, listen, this is, I, I wouldn't bet the ranch on this because it could be a few things, but, um, you know, I, let, let, let's assume that this is a, uh, an uncommon presentation of something more common rather than a common presentation of something less common. Let's, you know, okay. let, let's, let's not do zebra hunting. Yeah. So I said, let's treat this like it's a, it's a depression, but based on what you've tried before and based on your symptoms, I'm going to recommend uh, bupropion or Wellbutrin for you. Mm -hmm. um, so he started the Wellbutrin, um, was actually having a good response. It was helping with his mood, with his energy. Um, I saw him for follow-up. He was doing well. We were, uh, we had worked our way up to 450 milligrams. And he said, but he said, I, I'm really happy with the medicine. He said, the only problem is he goes, I'm having a terrible time sleeping. Uh -huh. I was like, well, you know, that can be a side effect with Wellbutrin, but often it's actually one of the less disruptive meds to sleep overall. Mm -hmm. I said, uh, I said, did it start happening when you started, when you got up to doing the full 450 in the morning? And he said, in the morning? <laughs> and I said, yeah, w yes. when are you taking? He said, well, I'm taking it at night. I'm like, well, uh, no, no, if we, you remember, if you look on your prescription, it says taken in the morning because it's pretty activating. Yeah. So I said, um, listen, what I'm going to have you do is skip, you know, skip, don't take a dose today. And then the following day, start it in the morning after you've been off for a day. Yeah. So unfortunately, he took 450 milligrams that night, sort of having oh. forgotten about it. Oh no! Took 450 milligrams the next morning <laughs> oh, and no. had and had a seizure that day. Oh no! Yeah. Um, recovered from the seizure well, didn't have any significant complications, and interestingly, he reported feeling pretty good after a seizure. A little <laughs> auto ECT. That's the history of ECT. That's where yeah. it comes from. But I, you know, I didn't feel comfortable, um, you know, continuing him on, even though we had a good reason for why this may have been the case, because I'd like yeah. to think that there's more buffer than that, than just yeah. taking twice the normal dose to induce a seizure. So yeah. I said, listen, I, I just think this isn't interested. I said, but we know from your testing that, you know, you, that you're, you're not an SSRI guy. Right. That doesn't necessarily knock out your ability to re respond to something serotonergic that, that maybe we just need to affect serotonin in a different way. Um, so I put him on Trintelix. Um, started him at 10 milligrams, yeah. doing well. He was tolerating it okay. Titrated up to 20 milligrams, and he was he was doing pretty well, but not as well as he had been doing on uh, the the 20 milligram, or not as well as he had done on the Wellbutrin. Yeah. Um, so I said, let let I'm going to have you try something. This is the highest dose, but I said I'm going to have you try to go up to 30 milligrams. Yeah. Um, I yeah. said because Trintelix, you're 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 likely chewing up your Trintelix faster than the average bear because That's of right. both, you know, because of the 2D6 and 2C19. That's right. Um, and I actually even was able to successfully argue with his insurance company based on his <laughs> pharmacogenetics and they actually covered the the higher than FDA approved dose. There you go. Another um, benefit of the genetic testing. Yeah. Exactly. So once we got him up to that dose, up to 30 milligrams, he really was was doing quite well and had, you know, and continued on that uh, that dose for the duration of time that I was still seeing him. Yeah. That's, 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 that's a great nice case. case. I, I I thought that um, he was going to become activated with the yeah. and then that was, that's that's what I thought was going to be. A but that is a really 
interesting case in which genetic testing proved very valuable, I think. Yeah, I'm curious what my colleagues think. I don't know that I would have avoided using bupropion in the future um, as long as he took it appropriately and, you know, didn't double up on it. But I could see why you'd be a little skittish about using it. What, Steve and, and Lex, what do you guys think? Yeah, I was going to say one thing. I have actually noticed some people have to take bupropion at night because it does take like three to five, six hours sometimes to reach the peak levels. Yeah. And I've had people sleep better when they take it at night yeah. than when they take it in the morning, which yeah. I, I think is kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, I also maybe would have considered in this guy, maybe like a Premapexel or- Sure. Uh, I was gonna mention that too. Dopamine yeah. agonism seems reasonable here. And yeah. really the one that's, that kind of screams to me also would be Cariprazine of Raylar, which you know, is the only one that really works at the D3 and that, that stimulates dopamine release into the prefrontal cortex. So, and, it, and it's much less likely to cause weight gain. So the 5-HT2C issue is not much of an issue. Um, but I think, look, you, you know, I think what you did makes great sense. I would, I would just, you know, watch, watch them carefully for the emergence of something more serious, bipolarity or something else, you know. I think we're going to go on because we have limited time to. Yeah, we need to move on. We could have. We could, I mean, we could continue to discuss this now. case and I'm sure get yeah. more lessons out of it. But yeah. Lex? Yeah, Lex. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so uh, my case is a uh, 39 year old female who uh, has a history of migraines since she was 12, which is pretty typical. Uh, but when she was 16 or 17 years old, she fell off a horse and sustained a traumatic brain injury. And after that injury, she's developed depression and anxiety. Uh, she's had other uh, injuries as well, uh, falling backward, backwards when she was hit by a wave uh, on the beach. Uh, another time where she dropped something on her hand. So she has some complex regional pain syndrome in her right upper extremity. Mm. Um, she has, uh, she was unfortunately also had a history of uh, being diagnosed with epilepsy. Further reading of the EEG uh, was determined that it was not, uh, but these were more kind of uh, myoclonic tremors, jerks, perhaps conversion disorder, no one was quite sure. There was a period of time where she couldn't speak. But she also developed vocal cord paralysis following an uh, intensive care uh, unit stay for, uh, I believe it was an infection. So she's had a lot to go through. Uh, when, when I got to see her, she had uh, the diagnosis of a major depression she also had chronic migraine, which she was receiving Botox treatment and a variety of medications for, and uh, POTS, postural orthostatic hypotension. She was on midogen for that. And uh, also a history of PTSD, which uh, I did not really uh, fully explore. She was in treatment with a therapist for that. Uh, and it sounds like it was a male assailant uh, with physical and sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. Talking to her, it was profound how she would have a prolonged latency to answering questions. Mm -hmm. And it seemed, I mean, honestly, it seemed at first that she was afraid to speak, mm -hmm. like as if the person uh, causing the abuse was still in the room or could still possibly hear her. It was, it was that kind of really severe, profound silence to questions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I saw her both with her wife present and without uh, to try to determine, you know, what was, if she could actually talk freely. I will say that even now a year and a half out uh, in treatment with her, there are some days where she's just like she was the first day and other days where she can actually speak freely or more freely than before. And some of this could actually be vocal cord paralysis and also mm -hmm. some memory difficulty where she just doesn't mm -hmm. like fully comprehend my question or can't really find the memory to answer it. When I, when I first saw her, she had been on the following regimen for uh, uh, about 10 years. Amitriptyline 50 milligrams, 
a mantadine 100 twice a day, which presumably is for the traumatic brain injury. Adderall XR 20 milligrams. Uh, she was also taking uh, duloxetine 120 milligram daily. Uh, she was on a CGRP monoclonal antibody for the migraine, uh, a, a thyroid hormone, pregabalin 200 milligrams three times a day, uh, and topiramate 100 milligrams twice a day. Uh, and also, I think I actually, by this point, midodrine had been discontinued. She no longer needed it for her POTS. And she was so, still getting the Botox? Left? And still getting the Botox. So a lot of medications here. And after 10 years of being on this, I said, well, we, is this really helping you? Is there something that we can do to eliminate or decrease? We often see this in migraine where we see uh, a patient being on a high dose SNRI plus a TCA. And in her case, she couldn't remember if this was beneficial or not. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, you know, maybe some of these like myoclonic jerks that you sometimes have that in the past people thought might have been epilepsy or pseudo seizures, maybe this is too much serotonin. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe this could be something that we could uh, decrease. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, let's try perhaps decreasing some of these medicines. We'll start with the Cymbalta perhaps. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, we'll get uh, genome mind uh, testing just to see if, there, if that could provide us any future directions of which medications to go to. Uh, before I continue, any, any thoughts, Andy? Oh goodness, Lex. Again, uh, this is the real world. This is <laughs> not a straightforward case. It's so rich. Uh, there's so many different ways we could go with this. But obviously, um, you know, PTSD complicates everything here. Um, and I'm glad she's in therapy for that. There's, she's had several incidents that the TBIs by themselves can cause PTSD. And then on top of that, of course, the assault. Um, I'm, I'm completely in agreement. My first thought when I heard this list of medicines is uh, a gasp because also duloxetine and, and Adderall and amphetamine is a dangerous combination, especially high dose duloxetine where you're really getting a lot of norepinephrine reuptake. Um, so I'd also worry about myoclonic jerks being, you know, a, a more adrenergic effect as well, um, which you can certainly see uh, tremors and jerking from that. Um, obviously, you want to make sure her thyroid is maximized. You know, a lot of times what I find, especially a lot of endocrinologists, they're very scared to push the, the thyroid hormone and, and they don't run the TSH down as low as certainly sometimes I'm comfortable with. I like to see TSH is in the one or less range. And, so that, that's another thought too, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm very curious to hear her genetic profile. Let me see what else I wrote here. Yeah, it, it is tough to disentangle. Obviously when you have that significant TBI, it's tough to disentangle how much of this is organic, you know, as, as you struggled with, with the speech latency and how much of this is a psychogenic conversion kind of thing as well. Yeah, it was really difficult, and I felt like this was going to require an establishment of trust going forward. Yeah. Um, yeah. Her her previous psychiatrist was really just seeing her for 20-minute med visits, refilling yeah. uh, Adderall, yeah. and she didn't yeah. really feel like she was getting anywhere with him. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, yeah. genome testing, to make it yeah. short, uh, the things that were pertinent was in the SLC684, Mm -hmm. uh, suggested that perhaps standard serotonergics might not work as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, you know, I was wondering, what about all this duloxetine and amitriptyline? I mean, right, right. Uh, I know they have a dual action, but that's still a lot of serotonin. And, and Absolutely. What is this really doing for her? Yeah. The, the COMPT gene also suggested that you know, a stimulant might actually be more helpful for her. Yes, case. yes, yeah. Uh, I've, I've used that too, the COMT. You know, it's funny, mutations typically make enzymes less active, but the COMT mutation here makes it more active. So it's chewing up dopamine more. And I find sometimes people who have that COMT mutation, I like amphetamines because they're even more than methylphenidates because they're more dopaminergic. So yeah, I, 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 I like the amphetamine idea. I just don't like it with high dose duloxetine and amitriptyline. Yeah. Uh, and... Uh, what about, you know, bupropion in a case like this? Would that be, would that also help provide some stimulation or would that be kind of together the amantadine causing too much stimulation? Right, and you mentioned amantadine. It's interesting. We used to think amantadine was a dopamine agonist, but we're learning more and more. It probably a lot of how it works is NMDA glutamate antagonism. 
So that's a fascinating that that one I'm I'm uh, fine with um, to be honest. Although, you know, I'm not sure if it added much overall psychiatrically, but it certainly it doesn't worry me as much the dopamine agonist part of it with the stimulant because we think it's probably a pretty weak dopamine agonist if at all now. So um, I'm, and, I'm fascinated to hear what you did. And then the other one showed that uh, she what he was uh, she was a, uh, a rapid metabolizer of two B six two B as in boy six two B six yeah yeah. Now I don't know specifically which of these is a two B six substrate. Um, perhaps duloxetine, but I don't know offhand, and perhaps amitriptyline. Well, I, I don't know. thinking that uh, you know, everything seemed to be okay going forward, I, I okay. what I decided to do was decrease the duloxetine and the amitriptyline yep, by increasing the Adderall XR when I got a chance. Yep, and that's to very add reasonable. Bupropion. Yeah. yeah, those are all, I think, very reasonable. I'm not too worried about bupropion added to either the Adderall or the amantadine, to be honest. Bupropion is a pretty weak, you know, norepinephrine dopamine reuptake inhibitor. It's probably also working through other means. You know, I don't think we fully understand how bupropion actually works, but um, yeah, I'm, yeah. O I'm okay with that. Yeah, and it's a 2B6 substrate as well, which is... Bupropion so, is. So funny enough that you yeah. mentioned that, uh, but, you know, she, she had some difficulty with discontinuation syndrome, uh, and could not lower yeah. the duloxetine under 60. Yeah, the so problem is you've got both of those are going to have withdrawal syndromes. We kept, it at, we kept it at 60. We were able to decrease the amitriptyline to 25 milligrams. Okay. And I uh, we added the bupropion and, and titrated it to 300 and then uh -huh. and uh, to 450. Mm -hmm. um, she had some muscle spasms, so I tapered the amitriptyline down to 10 milligrams. Uh, but then she had an emergency room visit. Um, and she had described three falls from kind of diffuse body muscle spasms uh, mm -hmm. for almost about three weeks. Oh, uh, and uh, in the uh, emergency room, her blood pressure temperature was normal. She heard her reflexes were normal, no clonus. This was not serotonin syndrome. Yeah, that's the thing. You um, about, yeah. She was having a headache and they had given her metoclopramide, which improved her headache. Okay. And, and it was at that point that I thought, well, uh, you know, maybe that maybe the amitriptyline needs to be tapered, tapered off completely. Mm -hmm. But did I make a mistake with the bupropion going up so high to 450? Right. And this was, I think, a situation where I made a mistake with her being a 2B6 rapid metabolizer, right. it actually means that she needs less bupropion I see. because of the um, active metabolite of bupropion being responsible for two thirds of the active nature of the compound. So Got I it. probably should have kept her at a lower dose. Got it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot of medicine, definitely. and. A lot of risk of drug drug interactions. I mean, I don't know that you need, to be honest, I don't know if you need bupropion if you've already got Adderall on board anyway, and especially your plan was to increase it. So rather than adding another one, you know, you could have peeled back the Dulox, amitriptyline, and go up on the Adderall. Um, certainly, Adderall has, you know, stimulants have a long history of helping people with TBI, especially with the kind of latency thing that you're talking about. Um, so I, I, I'm not here to tell you did anything wrong, certainly, but. Uh, uh, well, I mean, she's still world. with pain. She's still with depression. She thinks yeah. maybe her concentration is a little bit better, but yeah. she's appreciative, at least, of what I'm trying to do for her. Right. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, in the in the year that's gone by, you know, I've tried other medications. Um, mm -hmm. She had difficulty with uh, lamotrigine causing headache. Mm -hmm. um, Belanzapine worked great, but she gained mm -hmm. weight quickly within a yeah. week or two. That's that's uh, interesting. Lanzapine, lanzapine helped in what way? I'm just curious. Sorry, lanzapine helped in what way, Lex? It helped her mood and her headache. Interesting. Okay. I tried Abilify, but Abilify was causing restlessness, and we finally settled on uh, a low dose of Latuda. Uh -huh. That possibly coincidence, possibly not, but a couple of weeks after that, her mood is better. Mm -hmm. uh, 
she hasn't reported any major side effects from Latuda. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have her on this like low dose of, of bupropion, 20 mm -hmm. milligrams of Latuda, I think, mm -hmm. and the continued Cymbalta 60 milligrams and mm -hmm. some Adderall. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's still a work in progress, I suppose. Definitely. And, Definitely. What, well, what, I think is, what I think is interesting is that we all want to practice evidence-based medicine, but <laughs> you cannot look up these patients in a book that they, they don't exist. I do clinical trials, David. This patient would never make it into a clinical she trial. Not, no way. She would not qualify for a clinical yeah. trial. So we don't have any good, you're right. There's no data on the patient like this. Right. Um, one of, you know, my one thought I'll go back to is just to check on the thyroid and, and really see if you can maximize that, drive that as much as you can. Do you like the, you like to have a TSH greater or less than one? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I typically run it lower than one and endocrinologists get a little skittish. They like it in, you know, the two to four range, but sometimes that can, that can help a little bit, especially somebody who's sort of mentally slowed down like this and depressed. Um, you know, an atypical doesn't surprise me. An atypical would help here. PTSD with the PTSD component, I think. Um, and the TBI, you know, this, this can really help. With TBI, a lot of times you get this anhedonic, blunted sort of syndrome. So a stimulant and an atypical makes a lot of sense. You know, uh, we have a question from the, yeah. um, from the attendees. Are we trying to treat the illness or trying to decrease the severity of symptoms? <laughs> Lex, what was your goal here? You know, it, to me, it seemed like she was the same now as she was 10 years ago. And why are we taking all these pills? Is there anything that we can do with at least either get away with fewer pills and feel yeah. just as terrible? Yeah. Uh, or, you know, perhaps in some way improve some of the, the, the brain fog and concentration that she was exactly. having. Because I, you know, I, I really definitely felt that there's this is not a patient that is going to achieve remission right. with the PTSD sounding as right. severe as it was and Absolutely. depression now going for 22 years. Absolutely. Uh, we were hoping just at least for better quality of life in some kind of way. I think a really good outcome would be to clean up her meds. I agree with you and, and cut back on the number she's taking. I absolutely agree. Who Lex, what about the drug interactions are? Um, did you have uh, direct examination of the vocal cords? I'm interested in that. Or was that a conversion reaction? Uh, that would have been from 2003, I think. I don't have the records, but uh, it appears to have been uh, the case. Um, of course, she was still having difficulty speaking, right? Uh, still having difficulty speaking, but I, I don't know if she has continued problems with the vocal cords or if that has improved and how much of that is actually cognitive. Um, Right. It, it's tough getting her to speak almost it almost was like as if she had a broca's you know, aphasia in many ways but it's just this almost or like a thought blocking yeah uh, to many ways the other thought lex that occurs to me is you know the tapiramate is that clearly adding anything because we all know there's cognitive problems with tapiramate you know topomax they call it dopamax sometimes so this is a big problem that we have here because yeah it it, it could be potentially helping her headache yeah, absolutely. It could be significantly yeah. contributing to her concentration difficulty. Absolutely. And I absolutely. think that might be the next step to talk with her headache neurologist mm -hmm. um, that I work closely with. Mm -hmm. Should we try decreasing it? Um, a yeah. year ago, she did not want to. Yeah. Um, and uh, but perhaps maybe the, there could be a chance to, to do something in that respect. I mean, she's already on a CGRP a antagonist. Graduate, um, she's uh -huh. a college graduate. She worked as an occupational therapist until five years ago, despite oh, having all of these uh, yeah. problems. Yeah. Um, so I feel like there, there is work that could be done. She's already on a CGRP antagonist and Botox. So, you know, maybe she doesn't need the tapiramid any longer. I don't know. And then the pregabalin, I guess, is for the com complex pain syndrome. Yes. We, I don't think of that as much for migraines, right? It's, it, it's, very, it's not particularly helpful for migraine for most yeah. patients. And they're, they're using it for her uh, right upper extremity uh, complex regional pain syndrome. Yeah. It's just, it's a lot of psychoactive medications. A lot. That's concerning. <laughs> It's, it's, you know, you almost want to peel back to the bare bones and start over again, you know, and see what, what really is helping. Yeah. I think we should, you know, and then, 
especially since from one month to the next, yeah. uh, there's a difference that uh, in terms of her speech or her mood that I have to kind of determine yeah. how much of this is, um, yeah. is just coincidence or, or I've been fiddling with too many things. Yeah. Um, Boy, Lex, great case. Uh, you know, I think we can all sympathize with that case and with the frustration and sometimes the helplessness or the inadequacy we might feel as a treating clinician in a case like that. But I think just hanging in there and, and keeping on trying and, and demonstrating to the patient, you know, you're, you're, you're really trying hard to help her. I think also we sometimes don't talk about how important that relationship is and how important, you know, you're not giving up and not instilling frustration into the patient. Just propping up their hope is, is very important. All right, so should we, should we move on to our next one? Yeah, Steve. Steve. Steve, you, it's gonna be hard to top those two, Steve. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm not even gonna try. Uh, so this case is actually from a colleague of mine who uh, is part of my treatment resistant depression subspecialty clinic. And it's an active case, challenging active case with medical as well as psychiatric issues and pharmacogenetic findings. So um, Dr. Dowd, I think you have her accession number. So if, while I'm talking, maybe you can pull it up. There's a, there are a lot of findings. So I'm just going to kind of mm -hmm. like to just show it. Uh, okay. So she's 53 years old and she's been uh, seeing psychiatrists since she was in her teens for depression and some anxiety, not necessarily uh, obsessive compulsive uh, symptoms or panic symptoms, more like just a, an uneasiness around others. Uh, so I, not even to the point that it really rises to anything that I would say is diagnostic per se, but it's, it's a prominent component of her constellation of symptoms. Her primary depressive symptoms have been cognitive, just kind of feeling dull, uh, um, foggy. Uh, lately, she also talked about fatigue, some guilt, uh, low motivation. She has these chronic auditory hallucinations of a male voice. They are rarely intelligible, though sometimes they are. They're not commanding. They cause distress, but it's kind of been so chronic that she's kind of learned to live with it. Uh, it's hard for us to really control that. And it seems to concur with her depressive symptoms and not so much be independent. She's been through ECT and had some cognitive dysfunction and not a whole lot of improvement with her mood. So that was stopped. She's been through TMS and insurance issues got in the way. And also there wasn't a lot of improvement. So she stopped that. I started her um, on esketamine and she did show improvement at 84 milligrams twice weekly. However, uh, she developed a bowel obstruction, oh, got man. hospitalized. And while she was hospitalized, she couldn't continue the esketamine. They just didn't have the uh, ability to do it in mm -hmm. the hospital. Mm -hmm. Well, that... <laughs> At that point, her symptoms started getting worse, her depressive symptoms. Mm -hmm. She's back on the same dose of esketamine, but the depression hasn't improved. Uh, so uh, they're not sure what to do. Uh, we've tried augmenting sure. with several things. I want to show the genetic findings so that sure. you can understand why yeah, I did yeah. things I did. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So... We have tried to augment with Pramapexel uh -huh. because I think she's COMT Val, Val maybe. Can you, Dan, uh -huh. can you go to that? Oh, uh, no, she's Valmet. Okay, so she was yeah. Valmet, but we just tried it because we didn't know what else to do because she, uh, I'll tell you her list of meds. It's pretty extensive. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we start on L-methylfolate, which really um, was just, probably started a few months ago because we yeah. couldn't find an affordable way to get it and finally yeah. we were able to so yeah. we'll see if that helps yeah that's very reasonable yep yep she's on uh she was started on zinc because she was mildly deficient i've just seen some evidence that 
mm -hmm. correcting zinc deficiency can help with depression. And I, I have to say, mm -hmm. I don't know the mechanism behind that. Maybe you can um, educate if you know it on that mm -hmm. one. Co important cofactor in synthesis of monoamines. <laughs> okay, okay. Not sure what else. Uh, she has a history of a pancreas um, transplant. Oh, you're <laughs> so kidding. Here, wow. yeah, here, here at Nebraska, we do all kinds of transplants. We're kind of known for that. So she had a pancreas transplant. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's been getting in the way. She has some absorption issues uh, due to her transit problems, this right. she, kind of this functional bowel obstruction. She ended up having a sigmoid colectomy because of that. Wow. So we're, we're to the point now where uh, we just don't know uh, what mm -hmm. else to try. Here's her list of medicines just to okay. uh, to let you know. I'm going to read right through it. I, I looked them all up. Okay, so she's been on uh, lamotrigine, amitriptyline, uh, aripiprazole, cariprazine, uh, esketamine, mirtazapine, olanzapine. Hang on, uh, can you, hang on a second. Aripiprazole, sorry. cariprazine, esketamine, what else? Uh, mirtazapine. Oh, yeah, sure. Olanzapine. Yeah. Uh, she's been on a couple of stimulants, including methylphenidate, uh, metadate, CD, so uh -huh. uh, just different formulation, Concerta. Uh, Pramipexol, anywhere from 0.5 to 3 milligrams divided, BID to TID. Uh, Cretiapine up to 400 milligrams. Ropinerol. Yeah. Uh, topiramate. Trazodone. Bupropion. Duloxetine. Am I going too fast? No, no, it's amazing. Escitalopram, <laughs> <laughs> fluoxetine, sertraline, uh -huh. venlafaxine, uh, clonazepam, uh, and then Lunesta and Sonata for sleep. So those addition to us, ketamine, TMS, and ECT. Yes. <laughs> and I, wow. I see some comments. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. It'd be easier to say what she's not been on. That's right. Well, so, again, this oh, is she she also has a history of significant drug abuse. Uh, oh. She's been sober for uh, I think uh, near twenty years, but uh, yeah. it was uh, amphetamines. Um, I believe mm -hmm. I can tell you right now. I got her note right in front of me. Uh, yeah, she was a. Uh, amphetamines and cocaine quit in 1992 and alcoholism mm -hmm. quit in 1992 as well. So wow. clean for about 20 years. Okay. Well, let me start with the diagnostic conundrum here again. So here again, I'm smelling, you know, some clues that go along with bipolar, which I'm sure you've thought about here. And she's been on some potential bipolar meds, but you know, you've got this early onset teenage depression with anxiety, a lot of cognitive impairment, you know, the third most common comorbidity with with uh, bipolar is ADHD, uh, especially a lot of fatigue, anhedonia, amotivational. That, that's kind of how bipolars can present, especially with cognitive impairment. Um, substance abuse, you know, and anxiety. So it's the most common comorbidities are anxiety, substance abuse, and ADHD for bipolar. Um, the fact that ECT might have help, helped and S-ketamine helped, those probably help bipolar depression and unipolar depression and don't precipitate mania unlike our monoaminergic antidepressants destabilize. Um, she, you mentioned she was on lamotrigine and some of the atypical antipsychotics, which really make a lot of sense to me. I love the L-methylfolate, which I'm not saying that's gonna cause dramatic improvement, but- I've seen it change lives. I, I, yeah. I, I, I swear by the stuff, especially yeah. in compound heterozygotes or homozygous yeah, TTs. Exactly. Yeah, and people who take, you know, there's a lot of medications that interfere with the L-methylfolate conversion pathway from folate to L-methylfolate. Lamotrigine is a noted offender, by the way. So I don't know if she's still on Lamotrigine or not. I won't, but I will tell you one thing, Dr. Keller. She's yeah. on a B-complex vitamin, which I told her to stop because it's okay. not methylated. And I've yeah. heard that it competes with the L-methylfolate for the receptor on the blood-brain barrier. Okay. That may be. Okay. That I'm not aware of. Okay. I know that folate competes with L-methylfolate, but... Um, well, that would be the, the, I imagine the B complex has the folate in it is what I'm thinking. You know, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, that's folate. Right. That would compete because that's folic acid. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously I want to know her thyroid, as I said before, that's something I'm sure has been checked at some point, but yeah, know, it's in front to... of me. I'll look it up while you're talking and let you know. Sure. sure. Um, I also want to know, you know, I want to know a little more about the possibility of PTSD. Is that lurking in here too, uh, which could be. 
she did mm-hmm. lose an old fiance. I don't see symptoms of PTSD documented. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. But yeah, it was a significant loss. Um, yeah. And I'm not sure where she, what her personal experience was with that. Yeah. Um, it, I have, oh, the other thing I was thinking, by the way, is she on immunosuppression for the pancreas transplant? I'm not familiar with how that's handled. Uh, let's see, azothioprine. Yeah. Uh, she's on a couple of meds. I don't know uh, yeah. exactly what they are, you know, yeah. which usually means they are immunosuppressants. Yeah. Gal, galcanizumab. Yeah. And so, zumab means it's an uh, antibody. Okay. So there you go. It's a monoclonal antibody, are these zumabs for various things. So, you know, one of the things is obviously we're, we're learning more and more about the role of inflammation and depression, but that's why I want to know if she's, if she's immunosuppressed to some degree, she's on a, probably a powerful anti-inflammatory regimen, which is good, mm-hmm. potentially. Um, but yeah, this is, this is really, fat. You've, she's tried almost the whole psychopharmacopoeia. <laughs> so, I, you know, this is when you start thinking, you know, there's not a magic pill for this. It's, it's really just finding, minimizing the harm, if you will, uh-huh. and then looking at, at other things that are going on. I don't know if, if she exercises much, but there's abundant literature on the power of exercise. She actually was a trainer, I believe. Oh, my God. Uh, she's in pretty good shape. I mean, she's, she's, she's in good shape. She's kind yeah. of a tiny, tiny woman. I don't yeah. know if she still works out, but yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, she might have peeled back on that, you know, with everything that's going on. So you want to check that out. Um, let me just think, gosh, what else can I add to this one? You know, yeah. She's, she's been on stimulants. She's been on dopamine agonists, pamiprexol, rapinerol. You know, my, one of my favorite tricks is is the cariprazine, which mm-hmm. I feel like is is different in some ways from the others. And she's tried cariprazine, sounds like. She's the one, too, with the P-glycoprotein thing. And I just want to know, because with her GI stuff, I mm-hmm. I want to make sure whatever she is getting, she's absorbing it. Well, that's that's another huge question. You know, does she need, you know, heroic doses of things to just get in, you know, get absorbed? And then, you know, wanting to know, obviously, her, uh, her pharmacokinetic profile here for her genetic testing. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. So we've got the low activity of the PGP pump. There we go right there, the ABCB1, reduced activity of PGP. But that's leading to increased exposure of certain psychotics. That's interesting. There's a couple questions on the board, Andy, about- Sure, let's take a look here. One question is, was uh, 25-hydroxy vitamin D levels checked? Yeah. That's always a good question. They were, I'll tell you. Yeah. Yeah. The other question is, have you considered lithium augmentation? It's very reasonable. Again. You know, that, that, that's a good question. I don't see that it's ever been used. And her, her vitamin D was borderline low, it was 30. So uh, it's never gone above 44, four, uh, 56 one time and a couple of years ago. But no, it's, it, it's low. Yeah. She's on it, by the way, but not absorbing it very well, it looks like. Yeah. And I want to just highlight, Lex made a great comment. She has fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome. And I would say it sounds like she certainly would uh, potentially meet criteria for that. You know, and, and so she's been on SNRIs, duloxetine, she's been on stimulants, which are the things that I usually think about for that, but th- those are very reasonable things to do. You know, the other reason, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. The other reason I was thinking about the fibromyalgia chronic fatigue is that, you know, her OPRM1 receptor mm-hmm. uh, showed that it, it, I don't know if this is too much of a stretch, but that maybe her endogenous opioids work yeah. better than her exogenous ones. Yeah. And it, yeah, that's that, a great point. You know, we we use low dose naltrexone for fibromyalgia, mm-hmm. given this theory that uh, that perhaps it kind of increases endogenous opioid production. And you say that she was a trainer, and I bet that she probably does not there was a time that she got a rush from exercise and no mm-hmm. longer does. And would a low dose naltrexone in any way perhaps help with some of the depressive symptoms if we kind of buy into the inflammatory part of depression? Absolutely. You know, the other thing that comes to mind, I recently looked up some cases. Tramadol is, uh, has been shown to be effective for depression, although we don't think about it. It's a, a mu agonist and it's an, it got SNRI properties. So that's sort of in the same ballpark here. The one 
thing that hasn't been tried here is kind of trying to look at her opioid system and manipulate that a little bit. You know, the fact that she had, um, she had this history of substance abuse, right? That's another thing that's kind of saying maybe she's got dysregulated opioid system as well. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And, I like that. And we've, we've brought up dopamine agonists a couple times today, yeah. uh, but that's, I've never considered using a straight dopamine agonist like Primapexol for depression. Um, mm -hmm. would, when, when would a case, when would you turn to something like that? Well, there's a literature on Primapexol for bipolar depression. My friend Joe Goldberg has published on that. Um, you know, perhaps again, the COMT um, mutation, but also, I, you know, I tend to go more for amphetamines first, although it depends, it's a controlled substance. So if I can't use controlled substance, Primapexol would be a reasonable choice. Uh, what do you guys think? Uh, Steve, you got more? Yeah, like well, I, I've seen really good results with it. I don't use it often, but when I get, you know, for instance, this case, it's just... You start to look in the literature and uh, try whatever you can. And yeah. so, you know, I've, I've had a couple of people, it's about usually COMT valve valves are the ones that I use it yeah. on, but yeah. uh, there is good literature on it, both unipolar and bipolar. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And Steve, I, I, uh, I can't remember if you had mentioned uh, if she had tried like armadafinil or modafinil. Mm -hmm. Neither one of them actually. Yeah, that would be reasonable too. Yeah, I, I frequently will use that for for augmentation with pretty good results. If I've if I don't feel like it's a direct, you know, something that's going to be more responsive to something that's more dopaminergic. Yeah, very good because that, that those are not classic stimulants in the sense they may work through the orexin system or through the histamine system. That's totally different. And, you know, looking at her, you know, you've really hammered on the monoamines here, mm -hmm. which is reasonable. It's what we do, but. Um, so that's why I like thinking about the opioid system. I like thinking about other systems that could be going on. The fact that she responded to S-ketamine also says she's not, maybe not a monoamine type responder. There's something else this is glutamate, GABA, something else. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating that when she went back to the S-ketamine, it wasn't as effective. That's something that has been reported. People who have a good response to ketamine or S-ketamine and then they are, it's interrupted and you come back to it, it doesn't work as well for some reason. Don't, don't know the exact reason why, but. Well, again, uh, just like with Lex's case, you know, we certainly wish you a good luck and, and just hanging, hanging in there and keeping on trying. You know, I, Chris, I forgot to mention something very important. I wanna go back to your case for a second. Um, I actually have personal experience with what I'm about to tell you. And that is, I don't know if your case with especially the obsessiveness and the weird paranoid dissociation, if anybody thought of pandas, in him, you know, the post streptococcal syndrome. A nephew of mine had a presentation similar to this with a sort of sudden onset of, of a real obsessive paranoid kind of syndrome, and it was turned out it was pandas. Um, we, we, I, I do have a few pandas patients in my uh, in my practice, and I, I asked him about that. I, I wasn't impressed by the rapidity or the, I, you know, yeah. probably sort of the yeah. lack of rapidity of onset. Yeah. Um, uh, about that, but yeah, it's always that's always a great uh, yeah, <laughs> a great well. pickup. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, not not terribly responsive to treatments in, in my no. experience. If you don't catch it Let, early, but unless you catch it early, exactly right. Yeah. Well, well, I think it's, it's um, the clock it's, here, David. It's almost two o'clock, and I this exceeded my expectations. It was really great. I won't be surprised if you guys just get together on your own to continue this because. I have the feeling that you were feeding off each other in a very nice way, which is exactly the type of thing that we had hoped for. Yes. Really want to thank Dr. Cutler for his expertise. And, uh, you, you know, you clearly demonstrated why you're an expert psychopharmacologist, Andrew. Thank you. Uh, for Stephen, Lex, and Chris, I don't think it's an easy thing to put yourself out there and describe. Yes, thank you. Terribly challenging. And as I mentioned earlier, I think you have to have, <laughs> you have to believe strongly in yourself. I think that our patients don't read textbooks, but our discussants do read textbooks. <laughs> uh, it's an interesting intersection. Anyway, this was great. And I've Absolutely. already had questions about, can we do this again? And I have a case I'd like to present type of thing. So um, we may be knocking on your doors again. You, you know what, David, maybe you should solicit from your audience cases, have people submit cases, and then we can come back and talk about some other cases. That would be absolutely tremendous. And as I, I told one of the um, questioners, my email address is dlakedavid, K-R-A-U-S-E, 
at genomind.com. And I'm always available. I'm happy to very straightforward. speak with anybody at any time. So this was great. Exceeded expectations. A plus. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thanks, Thanks so much. Have a good rest of the week.